Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I want to discuss with you what is wrong about progressive calls for international for interventionism, since there was this piece in Foreign Affairs the other day that really needs some discussing. To help with that, uh, I asked my colleague and friend Christopher Mott to come online and talk about this. Chris Mott is a, a scholar at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. He holds a PhD in international relations from the University of St. Andrews, and he, ha he is the author of the book, The Formless Empire, a short history of diplomacy and warfare in Central Asia. Uh, he actually alerted me to this article, and what I want to discuss today is this one here uh, that was in Foreign Affairs, the progressive case for American power. Retrenchment would do more harm than good. It's quite a long article by... Uh, three scholars, two of whom I have I have here. Uh, the lead author is Megan Stewart, Associate Professor of, of Public Policy and the Director of International po the Policy Center at the Ford School, and uh, Jonathan Petcom uh, at Duke Law. And they basically just write a long piece on why it is important that the United States keeps, uh, keeps its interventionism up and going <laughs> and why progressives should agree. Um, Chris, what was your initial thought about this piece? Well, it's interesting because there's always been room for, I think, the progressive movement. This is obviously a U.S. focused piece, and there's always been room for the progressive movement to articulate more of a case about foreign policy because uh, they either ignore it or they don't really have that much of one. It, it, it can be a critique of whoever's in power, uh, but there isn't really much of a cohesive worldview. And so... I'm glad that people are grappling with the question, I guess I could say. Uh, but what they do in this piece, and I think we'll make this pretty clear, is they basically just restate liberal internationalism and liberal interventionism, uh, but with enough kind of talking points that sound like they're from like the Bernie Sanders left or even like left of that. But it's integrated in a worldview, which I would say is functionally indistinguishable from the typical liberal internationalism that is, I would argue, the dominant worldview of, of the Beltway. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that really struck me, if we look at, if we look at the piece again, uh, unfortunately, the whole, I can't read the whole thing, so I had to get the uglier version from my, from my library. But, um, you know, they keep emphasizing that uh, this is the whole the punchline here. Progressives need to get comfortable with American power and restrained risks giving free reign to decidedly regressive forces in the world, such as China's authoritarian influence across the global south, Iran's fancying off of terrorism in the Middle East, and Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And this sounds very, very standard to me, as in uh, there are evil forces in the world. And the United States, for all its flaws, and then they admit a couple of the flaws, uh, is a force for good. And therefore, there's a moral reason that pushes us to accept that we have to. I mean, the United States has to uh, use its power in international relations. And they try to package this as a form of, uh, of well, being progressive, you know, the progressive case. Um, it's something that you pointed out in an article that you wrote earlier with Arta Moeni about this e eternal um, two, uh, 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 two, uh, two hearts in, in the chest of the United States, one being the Washingtonites who, who think that no, restraint is a, is, a, is a virtue and focusing on their own country, and the other one is the Jeffersonites who think like, no, there is a higher cause in the world, and of course, we are the liberal uh, enlightened version of the best people who've ever been here. And therefore we need to carry that out to everybody else. We need to liberate the others from regressive forces. And this is just the latest version of that one, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the first time I went on your show, it was to talk about, because you had discovered my, uh, my white paper, Woke Imperium. <laughs> and this piece is kind of like the Woke Imperium people just outright saying what I said about them as a critique, but now it's from their own perspective. And that is that there's always this messianic drive with certain people who are foreign policy interventions. And I think that that drive was assumed, particularly by people on the left, to be more of a right wing or centrist thing. But the all the ingredients have been there and have been there for over a decade now, at least, as well as other periods in history where progressives were 
quite expansionistic as well. Um, and, and there's always been this moralism that can be used to get people, including people who are like left of the Democratic Party ostensibly, on board with these kinds of projects. And it's always sold in this way that like we can help humanity evolve forward. Like we're always moving forward, we're we're uplifting the race. It's it's an internationalism, if you will. It's a, it's a progressive internationalism. Uh, but what it does is it makes the same assumptions that all the other groups, that some of which they critique in their own piece, made, which is that they're the protagonists of history, um, that they have access to a special kind of cheat sheet that might be rooted in their ideology, and if everyone follows that cheat sheet, they get to pass the test. And they just want to help people uh, move along on this kind of linear model of development. But if there's one thing I think that geopolitical history shows is that divergence is just as common as uh, unification. And that if you try to push your values on others, and this is a big oversight uh, I think they have, even when they admit some problems with interventionism, um, when you try to push this, you'll get a pushback. You can't just assume you're quote unquote on the right side of history. Um, that my, my my first piece for Agon actually was literally just taking completely trying to dismantle the concept of there being a right side of history because it's a polycentric world and there's too many different tribes and they disagree with things. And um, the idea that you are going to help people follow a path of just the whole world moving towards your vision of how things govern, it presupposes that there's a world sovereign that you're appealing to, which is something that does exist in domestic politics at least in stable societies, there's one government that governs the country. You can kind of advocate for that government to have a worldview uh, because you're part of it. But it does not exist for uh, at the world stage. The UN does not have the power to overrule uh, most of its member states. So like what, how do they think this would actually work? And it's interesting that there's, there's at least an attempt to explain this. They say that progressives should support adding more members to the UN Security Council, for example. Uh, that's actually like, I think that's a pretty valid point. Like, I, I think the UN Security Council should include countries like Brazil, uh, Japan, India, etc. Um, I, I think it would make it more useful because everyone knows the Security Council has more power than the General Assembly. Um, but it's weird for progressives to make this case because they're actually advocating for lots of people outside of the North Atlantic <laughs> to join uh, outside of just Russia and China. And those people are going to have different values. And if they're insisting on seeing North Atlantic progressivism as the path forward to global peace, then how is it going to help them? It might help like some things I want, but how is it going to help them uh, if their Security Council then brings a bunch of countries like India to the table who might have very different opinions on some of these matters? Yeah, and it's also strange to me because that's a prescription, you know, that can probably that everybody can sign up to, but that is for like very unrealistic to actually happen. It's just unrealistic that all of the five great powers in the Security Council will agree to dilute their influence over this institution. So the UN is pretty much deadlocked in what it is. So uh, shelling out these good proposals, which are good proposals, you know, the Japanese have said the same and everybody says the same, everybody agrees, but but, but most people understand this is, this is probably uh, probably uh, utterly Im uh, impossible. So uh, it's it kind of, it, 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 to me, it's also a way of just virtue signaling of this group of people to say like, oh, we want to make the world a better place. and one way is us power the other way is all of these all of these ideals that we have uh, but we need to use hard uh, power in order to restrain the evil and of course this casting of the other as the evil i find that fascinating you know that it is utterly clear to these people that russia iran and china they are they're bad right they're 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 horrible and somebody needs to stop them and 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 who else but uh, uncle sam and nato and so on the good guys um, and they they, why... pick, they pick the three countries that are on the neoconservative hit list too. So it, it's kind of like, oh, you're not being that different from many of the people you're critiquing if you're doing this. No, it's it sounds it sounds like neoconservatism with a different with a with a with a different spin to it, um, with a with a progressive with a progressive mindset. But the outcome is exactly the same. Um, in other you know, words, when... they want the German Green Party, but in the United States, they want what? The German Green Party, but in the U.S. Oh. 
Yeah, yeah, the Green Party transformed completely from uh, being pro peace to uh, basically being super happy with send sending weapons of whatever whatever sign, uh, kind to uh, to Ukraine and and intervention. There's a beautiful book, a German book. Uh, the the title is uh, "Never Again War," and then in brackets without us <laughs> about the Green Party. I think that that uh, that hits it quite well. Um, it's not the only thing they changed too. They, they they changed their stance on coal power too. So now it's a pro coal, um, <laughs> anti nuclear, pro war, pro surveillance Green Party. It's it's one of the most fascinating uh, political party evolutions of the past few years, I would say. And I think that an article like this is saying that the United States should follow a similar <laughs> route. That the uh, the the left wing of uh, we don't really have our unfortunately our Green Party isn't that powerful, but you know people left of Democratic mainline should effectively follow the the Baerbock program and and kind of become the arsenal of the world. But of course, in the U.S. context, this is extra weird because uh, uh, the Pentagon and the military uh, uh, acquisitions of the U.S. is one of the world's biggest. I think it might even be the world's biggest polluter. So it's an interesting uh, confluence of uh, events. It's um again, it's this repackaging. It's repackaging of inter interventionism abroad under under values and ideals that uh sta like normal liberals can actually can agree to. And the the piece at the very end um also makes this argument, you know, that if if the United States, I think here it is. Um, by dialing back its modest support of the uh, relatively progressive SDF in, um, in, in Syria, the United States would enable Iran, Russia and ISIS to expand their influence in Syria and foil one of the region's new democratic independence movements. You know, this, this idea that um, if you don't intervene and, or if you scale back intervention and everything's going to get worse. And this is interesting in this article because all the arguments basically for intervention are either constructed around um, theoretical ideals or uh, hypothetical worst case scenarios. <laughs> they, even when they look at Afghanistan, you know, they say like, okay, we, we intervene for 20 years and you and I, we, for us, this is a, this is a, this is a proof that intervention doesn't, doesn't achieve its goals, right? It's, it, it just makes a lot of things often quite worse. Um, and they take, they, they take the opposite lessons. They're like, okay, after 20 years, we, we, we withdrew and then immediately everything became much worse. Uh, and the, um, the Taliban took over and now, uh, uh, women and girls are suffering. It's interesting that always with Afghanistan, at the end, is always women and girls. It only happens in Afghanistan, not with Syria, not with uh, with other theaters, but in Afghanistan, always women and girls. Um, well, they certainly couldn't they... use that argument in Syria because of <laughs> to intervene in Syria. Uh, I mean, this this particular example, there's I really take issue with like more than many of the other ones because. Uh, most of the people we supported in Syrian civil war, we meaning like you know NATO countries, um, were not the SDF. Now we did, we do, and did support the SDF. This is true, but we also supported uh, many groups that were allied with or had members defect to Al Nusra, uh, members that would then go on to ban girls' education, and set up you know theocratic strongholds, uh, basically Islamic jihad, effectively. And it's really, really. Uh, so a problem I've always had with how like the Anglo left uh, conceptualizes Middle Eastern foreign, foreign policy is that they're really, really hyper fo focused on Kurds because they see Kurds as like this one progressive example of something that's kind of pseudo internationalist, whatever project, which it, it is not. It's a nationalist project that just happens to cross multiple countries borders. Um, but like. What would I want to throw them like they, they're worried about all these worst case scenarios? My worst case scenario is their best case scenario, which is a US backed Kurdish independence movement in multiple countries. Because, like, what would that actually look like? It would look like a, attempting to carve a second Israel out of the place, except it wouldn't even have a port, it wouldn't even have ocean access, it would be a landlocked construction crossing the borders of Syria. Uh, we wouldn't do Turkey because they're too important of an ally, but theoretically, you know, Turkey, Iran and Iraq, and it would be landlocked. It would be dependent on the US. Everyone would hate it. Everyone would hate the US for supporting it. It would poison our, our diplomatic relations with everyone in the 
region, even more than they already are. And this is viewed by so many like people of these kind of left wing sympathies as like a great thing because it's like an experiment in in the next phase of socialism or whatever. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry, like this is why I think you should separate domestic politics from foreign policy because you're going to get talked into supporting things that make no sense and will get you into a lot of trouble down the road. Yeah, the, the the argumentation is really, really fascinating, you know. Um, can I just point out this one here to you as well? The um the <laughs> out that outside of war retrenchments can similarly undermine progressive goals. Consider the extensive role Washington played in preventing a coup in Brazil from 2021 to 2022. And then the piece goes on with how awesome the United States uh, supported a democratic uh, Brazil and how the US is very pivotal in preventing coups in democratic countries from, from occurring. Um, and, and when I read this, I was like, okay, these people really... Uh, they they never read all of these books on all of the the US sponsored coups since 45 and and they just ignore basically and we have probably something between 50 to 80 examples on the other on the other side that we could cite on on US supporting coups and they picked one and I don't actually know whether this is true or not I I don't have enough information but um what do you think about this framing of the U.S. as a force for good for democracy, when obviously the U.S. usually intervenes on the side of the ones that give them give the U.S. the most benefits, what, be it auto, uh, autocratic regimes in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan or a couple of democracies in Europe? I mean, the U.S. doesn't care very much about the nature of the regime, it, it seems to me. I think it's a weird example to use because... If you're going to do an, an argument about coups, then you're eventually going to have to just stack them. How many coups did the U.S. support and how many has it opposed? And I don't think the ratio is going to look all that favorable. Now, the U.S. has opposed some coups in the past. I'm not convinced that what happened in Brazil was a coup attempt any more than I'm convinced that what happened on January 6th was a coup attempt. I think, you know, these things are like bad, they're not good, but uh, I think some people are exaggerating what they really were. Um, people, there are certain countries that are used to people rioting in in around their capital buildings. Um, it's not a good thing, but it, it, saying that, that they were, you know, one step away from seizing power in the government, I don't think so. It seemed to me like Brazil's um, elections worked as intended. And an unpopular and, in my opinion, incompetent leader was uh, removed from power after an unsuccessful term in office. And there was a riot, but looked like Brazil worked to me. I'm, uh, whatever the U.S. might have done behind the scenes, uh, even if it turns out to be substantial, I don't think that that undoes, you know, 1950. Free in Iran. I don't think it does, <laughs> you know, removing Aristide and Haiti. I, I don't think it, you know, there's just too many counterexamples. So it, it's, it's, that's cherry picking to find as far as I'm concerned. Then, um, what, what, what I wonder is just how is it that I, I believe that these people believe this? I, I, I believe that they write this from out of conviction. And then it gets printed in foreign affairs. And this is, of course, a very influential uh, foreign policy magazine, maybe the most influential foreign policy magazine in the US. And this is this is something uh, which which creates the the mindset or, or, or is part of the mindset of an entire group of people. Why do you think that this the, that these intelligent people don't recognize that what they're doing is cherry picking and scaremongering when it comes to, you know, these worst case scenarios? Yeah, I'm not sure. I I think I think part of true belief is knowing that you have to compromise with the argument. I wouldn't be surprised if if they're well aware of of the counterexamples that we both mentioned, but that they're they're just really afraid of what the consequences will be of greater retrenchment. And they're saying, but look, if you're progressive, you can counteract for many of the negative impacts of these types of policies and more effectively select. Uh, the positive uh, versions of these policies going forward. But to me, with like, I think that this, it, it's funny because in this article, the authors make a, a valid point that you can't talk about US foreign policy in a vacuum, you know, that, that other actors are always acting and reacting too. But if you take that correct assumption forward, it means that you cannot make this case that, <laughs> that current day, progressive Americans 
who are the true protagonists of history, the ones who will be able to create the, the correct synthesis of interventionism and anti-interventionism on a system that they acknowledge under past hands did not perform the best it could have. <laughs> but they're going to do it different because they see certain critiques of the past. Now, I don't think that that's a good argument to make if you have a lot of blind spots of your own, right? Like you, you can't assume that you are immune to the wrong call, uh, that you won't be, uh, your government won't respond negatively towards a foreign government reacting to you, uh, that you might not always be the most rational person in the world, and that you might, if you're particularly attached to a domestic ideology and putting it in foreign policy, that you might yourself not be calculating in a way that is <laughs> always entirely rational. Um, so, like, I, I just don't see... I just think that there should be a separation between how people conceptualize domestic and foreign policy because uh, domestic policy, like I said, that has a sovereign to appeal to. Uh, foreign policy does not. The other thing is, if you're going to really put progressive values forward, which is their solution to this kind of these inherited problems of U.S. foreign policy, uh, you have to then admit that what you're doing is you're trying to kind of more make foreign policy more tied. Uh, even more to domestic politics. And that means that the next election cycle, your guys might lose. What happens then? You have created a, a state that is like a crusader state. Well, what happens if the, you know, a completely different side than you support takes power in your own country and decides to use that logic and that apparatus for a totally different reason? This is not ancient history. I mean, this kind of like culture war going abroad stuff it didn't start with you know in 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 super recent history even just in 21st century american history like this is like bush administration religious right type stuff they did stuff like this they went into africa and they tried to make all of the aid programs uh, uh based around like a kind of uh um, abstinence only education. So they had this whole attempt to, to turn all like reproductive health in the African continent into something that promoted abstinence only education. It was a dismal, dismal failure. They spent millions and millions of dollars on this. And of course, it didn't work at all. <laughs> and, and that, you know, the stuff like that is an example. Also, the religious rights um, fervor for the state of Israel. Uh, is very much tied to their kind of conception of religion and religious views influencing policy. Now, I don't see how progressives can look at this very recent history and say that, oh, but if we do it progressively, it will be better. <laughs> like, it, it's just kind of admitting that you don't even want to have a rational, like, uh, cost-benefit calculus anymore. You really want to just extrapolate your domestic priorities abroad. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. Yeah, I think I think you're right. That's what it is. It's the it's the imposition of what you believe is right at home onto the international sphere. It, and you you see that in this article quite clearly that these the, the that these authors have core beliefs, and according to these beliefs, the international world should behave like this, and the U.S. Um, should do everything it can, including using military force. Um, in order to bring it about. So it is this messianic belief of like our way of, of looking at the world is the best and everything, uh, even military power should should serve that final goal. Um, leaving leaving aside the the even the option that maybe you're looking at it wrong and also the option that there's even, there's other people inside your own country who don't disagree who disagree with you. So just think of what happens then on the world stage with with that view. Um, Especially if you strike. fail, right? Especially if you explicitly say, we're going into country X to support this minority group or that kind of progressive policy, and it backfires horribly, that might inspire in the next election cycle, you know, a someone who is completely the opposite of you to, to profit from this <laughs> mess that you've created. So, yeah, I just don't see how this could end. Oh, and also the the issue that then whenever things don't go uh, militarily the way that they're supposed to, then we we also see that these same people are then st still very willing as a as a form of uh, revenge, basically to put quite horrible um, 
policies on these countries. I mean, Afghanistan is the standard example. So 20 years of warfare, it didn't achieve what it, what it was supposed to. The Talib you didn't get rid of the Taliban. The Taliban come back at the very next day. You have the harshest U.S. sanctions in the world that the U.S. confiscates national uh, sovereign wealth of Afghanistan and sanctions that really even medicine cannot make its way anymore into Afghanistan and people are dying of, the, of really horrible uh, diseases. And um, this seems to be something that these, I mean, they don't write about this in the, in this article, so it's unfair to say that these are... I, 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 well, I have to give them credit. They do mention that the U.S. sanctions on Afghanistan are very ruthless and that they probably should be ended. They, they mention that at the very end of the piece. It's a very afterthought. Okay. Like, they at the very end of the article, they realized, oh, this might be... Someone could read our article and, and think that... So they add it as kind of a fail-safe. But it is the inevitable outcome of the policies that they advocate. So... Um, do you what what would you think in the U.S. among the liberals and and progressives? What's the split? How many of these people? How 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 many percent are on this side of the progressive wing, and how many on the you know the Jeffrey Sachs kind of type, which they actually correctly analyze at in the beginning of the of the article? I think uh, the 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 people like us who, who argue that no, we shouldn't try to impose our Western liberal values on everybody else. Uh, even even if there's countries with horrible uh, human rights records and 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 you know doing doing bad things to gay people like 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 us, but it's just not our place to impose that. What's the split? Would you say? I could not give you you know something that you could cite for that because it's hard to tell. I, I think there is, and this will surprise no one who's been paying attention to discourse the past ten years. I think that there has been a huge culture of self-censorship and silence uh, around much of the American left recently because they're so terminally online and so afraid of cancellation that they, um, uh, I don't know if you always hear what they really think, um, but I can tell you as someone who is more connected to the left than the center or the right, I'm not sure I would say I'm entirely on the left anymore because things, as you know, things have just gotten very weird in the recent times, but um, more close to them than anyone else. I would say that like, I would say more than half of them probably are deeply skeptical about this interventionist term, but not an overwhelming majority like it would have been any time more than like five, eight years ago, something like that. Um, it, it, it's... It's really hard to quantify, uh, but I suspect that more people would be skeptical of this than support it. But to, the counterpoint to that is the closer someone is to power, the closer someone is to the media, the closer someone is to maybe even affecting policy under conditions of the Democratic administration, the more likely they would be to agree with us. So yeah, like numbers wise, probably people are very skeptical, rightly so, but for policy wonk people, it probably kind of tilts more in the other direction, where they're like, oh, uh, yeah, we could make a progressive interventionist case. And you can see this in the career, um, such as it is, of uh, my own <laughs> senator, John Fetterman, who ran as a very, very strong progressive. Now, he was always very, very pro-Israel. He didn't have, like, like many progressives, he didn't really have well-articulated our policy views. Um, he decided to kind of chase APAC support in his primary, and and but we all knew that going into the election. We all knew that he wasn't great on that issue. Uh, but he ran as like a very populist, very economics focused candidate, and um, then you know he got elected, and he basically became <laughs> what <laughs> my friends and I increasingly refer to as uh, Netanyahu's own golem in the Senate. Um, he has become very aggressively um, a, a neoconservative on foreign policy. And it's not just Israel, though he really, really makes that a centerpiece, but it's like everything. It's Ukraine, it's, it's you know, de uh, defense spending budgets. Uh, and, and he complains, anyone that, that mentions it and, and says this is what I voted for, he, he's very aggressive uh, at yelling at criticism about that and uh you know we've seen this happen before too in, in uh, a few years ago when um when uh, uh kirsten uh Sinema from arizona she was a former anti-war activist and, and green party member even she entered the senate and and uh she became like a weird kind of 
of uh, Joe Manchin centrist uh, neoliberal type, and and uh, and both of them are very famous for their their terrible um, fashion sense. So I, I really have to ask, like, you know, what is going on with Gen Xers in the Senate? I have no idea, but there is this very like strong temptation to run as a progressive and then govern as a neoliberal. And uh, I kind of suspect that that would happen on foreign policy, too, just as it happens on domestic policy. There's something that shifts people, right? And then there's there's arguments that at some point take root. Um, for me, the interesting one or the most obvious one was the Ukraine war, where a lot, a lot of lefty progressives suddenly were sold on the idea that, you know, it's not US imperialism that's the problem, it's Russian imperialism. And fighting Russian imperialism is, is an overriding uh, obligation over any kind of concerns over uh, U.S. imperialism, which they still would say like exists, but it's, it's so much more benign than the other one. And the article mentions that very clearly. And it's one more of the scaremongering tactics to say, like, if we withdrew our support for Ukraine, then, you know, you would have massacres and the Ukrainians would die en masse and, and Russia would be the most brutal regime to the Ukrainians ever, for which there is no indication whatsoever. <laughs> this, the history, the last 30 years between Ukraine and Russia have not been one where Russia has, has been trying to slaughter as many Ukrainians as possible. The slaughtering started with the war and the slaughtering actually happens more or less on the battlefield as opposed to what we see in Israel, where it happens in the in Gaza, right, and, and among the civilians. Um, how do you think that the impact of certain seemingly clear-cut cases is on the thinking of progressives um, or why it is that progressives are much are so, were so easily sold on the Ukraine war. I think, and this comes up in the article significantly, I think it's very, very easy to sell it as an anti-imperialist war uh, and with mm -hmm. Russia as the imperial aggressor. Now, I'm not unsympathetic to this argument, even though I'm very unsympathetic to the U.S. being involved in the conflict. Um, <laughs> but I, I I, think that, yes, Russia, <laughs> Russia is the primary actor, it, it, even though I do think that Russia was provoked in many ways, and I do think NATO expansion was a massive mistake. I think, you know, Russia ultimately must bear responsibility for the decisions it has made towards its near abroad. Um, I don't disagree with that. But the idea that that one can and should police everyone's behavior, no matter how objectionable you find it, is what I have a problem with. And the idea that this isn't a lot of contested grab, like you can't just put an imperial versus anti-imperial sticker on this when you have areas like Ukraine and the Donbass, which would, for the most part, rather be with Russia. There is a, you know, <laughs> it's more complicated than that. Even if I, I agree that, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of Russian foreign policy here. Um, it, it's too complicated to make such a weird, uh, a, a absolute comparison. And, but yet, people that don't really understand these things, that they don't look at regions and regional dynamics, uh, they don't perhaps look at who uh, every actor in these countries and who can blame them if you don't live in them if you don't order them then okay I, I get it but it's just becomes very easy to talk into people oh you want to be a consistent anti-imperialist uh well this is a war for you you know and, and and isn't it weird that there's people that think that everything in the u.s is bad and therefore the u.s rivals are always good but that's usually not how critics of U.S. foreign policy like myself conceptualize it. I don't think anyone is good <laughs> in, in geopolitics. So new geopolitics requires a level of moral neutrality to understand what's going on. And I think there is a, a weird, it's just too easy to moralize everything, you know? Like, but the fact of the matter is Russia is going to have escalation dominance over any country far away from Ukraine because it's immediate to its interests. And if you really think that this is vital for the international system in the world at large. Um, okay, but you're gonna have to explain why, because I'm incredibly skeptical of that claim. Uh, but it's easy to rally people around. And and the, you see people that are like, oh yeah, the Russia, what Russia's doing in Ukraine is the same as what country X is doing in this country, whatever. And it's like, okay, but like no one can, no one has the resources and the power to make foreign policy around platonic idealism, right? No one can say, 
this is principle that we are opposed to. We will be opposed to it everywhere around the world because if they tried to uphold those values, they would go bankrupt and it would be unpopular. They would take casualties and forcing all the peacekeeping. They have to pick and choose. And so the only rational choice you have left is what is worth it for the average citizen to, to, to potentially be involved in. And I would say in most cases, the answer is not to be involved. Uh, these authors would probably disagree with me, but that is how it is. It's just like, you you can't organize everything around the fundamental principle. So uh, unless that principle, in my opinion, is sovereignty, because that's how you talk to people without them constantly fearing that you're trying to overthrow them. <laughs> yeah, and, and to acknowledge that principle means acknowledging that different governments and different social systems will exist and therefore um, must be accommodated for, which is not something I think these authors are very interested in. Yeah, so in this sense, the the authors of this piece have something very important in common with the, with the neocons, which is, of course, the belief that what they want um, overrides what what others uh, overrides anything else, right? The neocons for, first and foremost want power, <laughs> and these people first and foremost want values to govern, and for those they're willing to do whatever it takes, and then um, also put put an adequate spin on it, and it relies on an oversimplification of the world. But that's where they both meet. They can meet in we are the good ones, they're the bad ones. Therefore, let's go and fight, right? And the, the, Again, if you you have to ignore a very long and complicated history of every conflict in order to make that argument, but it comes up again and again in in this strain of thought and in the neocon strain of thought. So, oversimplification is the way to go for them to sell it, I suppose. Yeah, and it's also why I think people are attracted to stuff like this, even if they're they're not part of like the power elite. It's it's just attractive to say, oh yeah, I of course I oppose you know the U.S. war in Iraq or Libya, but I'm also like tough and strong, and I oppose Russia and Ukraine. It's like okay, but you're not a citizen of Russia or Ukraine, so your opinion automatically counts for less. But but okay, you know, like it's a statement of principle without really being a statement of substantive policy. Okay, Christopher, I am seeing that the sun is setting <laughs> at, well, where where you are at the moment. It's getting darker, and I guess that's that's a cue for us. Um, thank you very much for helping uh, us with for helping me with analyzing this piece. It's always great to hear your thought. Yeah, of course, my pleasure.